Okay, last quick check. Can everyone hear me? I can. All right, and everyone sees the slides. Yes. Problem clear, okay. side by side. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to give this presentation to you folks. Uh, my name is Andy Stewart. My call sign, Kilo Bravo One, Oscar, India, Quebec. And I live in Westford, Massachusetts, about 25 miles northwest of Boston. And I'm happy to give you this presentation about Linux in your ham shack. And just so that people have some idea of who I am, uh, I've been in the hobby since aught seven, and I earned my uh, extra class license a couple of years later. Uh, I was the president of the local ham radio club for about 10 years and uh, vice president for a couple of years around that. Uh, I did some work with the, uh, the ARRL section here in Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, back in 1997, I founded the Worcester Linux Users Group when I was living in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I haven't participated in that group for some time, but they're still going quite strongly, uh, last I knew. And uh, when I moved up to the, the Chelmsford, Massachusetts area right next door, uh, I started a, a Linux meetup group. Uh, and I've been running that. I ran that until just before COVID started, and uh, we've not gotten back together since, uh, mostly because I didn't get off the dime. Uh, I also had occasion to uh, teach Linux courses at the uh, evening uh, adult education program, and I did that for many years uh, to uh, the joy of lots of people who took the class. Uh, I've been using Linux since 1997, and by day, I'm a computer engineer. Uh, I build computer simulations to test uh, digital logic circuits, and in short, I get paid to break things, and I have a lot of fun doing that. So my more recent interests, and I, my interests vary. There's so many things to do in this hobby, it's hard to be bored. Uh, more recently, I've been interested in the antique radios and specifically the, electro, the electrical restoration thereof, uh, especially late 1930s, early 1940s. And I've done about a half a dozen of them successfully, and I, I find it rather relaxing to get in there uh, with something that I actually have room to solder uh, as opposed to surface mount, which is quite challenging. Uh, I do a lot of home brewing, uh, both making things on pine boards and soldering together uh, commercially available kits. I have a lot of fun with all of that. And uh, last winter, I built myself a 1920s style regenerative receiver uh, with pluggable coils for different frequency ranges. I found the schematic online, I implemented it, and it works pretty well. I have fun with that. Uh, FT8 and Grid Tracker, I've had fun playing with that, but now that the bands are getting better, I'd like to get more into uh, phone and CW. Uh, I enjoy fox hunting, both hiding the fox and uh, looking for it. And of course, I enjoy spending time creating uh, Andy's Ham Radio Linux and tweaking it and putting it out there for everyone to use and hopefully enjoy. So what are my goals here? Well, my goals in part are to promote Linux uh, which of course is a free and open source operating system that's out there that is an alternative to Microsoft Windows and uh, a Mac OS. And uh, it can be freely downloaded and used by anybody. Uh, you can modify the code if you wish, you can get the source code, you can configure it to your heart's content. And uh, it runs on, uh, the, the version I have runs on x86-64 machines. Uh, I don't do the 32-bit version anymore because uh, nobody was downloading it. And I, I do this to give back to both the ham radio communities and the Linux communities from whom I've gotten so much uh, Elmering and tutelage and so forth. And so this is my way of giving back to those communities. Uh, but I didn't wanna build it from scratch. That's an awful lot of work. So what I decided to do is build this on top of an existing uh, Linux collection of, of software, otherwise known as a distribution. <clears throat> and I chose the Ubuntu distribution because it's one with which I'm very familiar. And so I wanted to create a software collection containing as much ham radio software as possible, all of it being free and open source software, nothing proprietary at all. And my goal was everything just works. Now that's a pretty big goal with any computer these days, but my focus was that you would spend time using the computer and enjoying the radio. I don't think any of us need yet another computer to babysit and fuss with and swear at and so forth. So my hope is that everything just works. And I've tried really hard to make that happen. And so focus on the radio hobby where the computer is a tool to assist that, not the other way around. So the idea of Andy's Ham Radio Linux 
began that way. And you can tell I'm an engineer, not a marketing type by its name, but uh, that name has stuck. And sometimes you might hear me refer to it as AHRL for short. So Andy's Hammer Radio Linux, what is it? Well, I have version 25 that I just put out there uh, about six weeks ago. It's got about 2,700 downloads as we speak. And it's based on X Ubuntu version 22.04. Now, when I say remastered, what I mean is I took the Ubuntu software collection I deleted some software packages that I didn't think were necessary, and I added software packages that were related to ham radio. And in some packages, the uh, some cases, the packages were available as part of the Ubuntu repository. And in other cases, I had to build it directly from source and install it so that you wouldn't have to go through that. Uh, some people know how to do it, some people don't, and occasionally it's rather painful. And so I wanted to take all of that pain away from you and so that when you click the menu, the application just comes up and it just works. That, that's the goal. So when I did all of this, I created a single ISO file, which is just under four gigabytes in size, and it can be downloaded from the SourceForge website. You can search for Andy's Ham Radio Linux or search for my call sign, KB1OIQ, and you'll find it. And as I said before, everything on there is covered by the GNU General Public License or a similar free software license. No, no proprietary software uh, for two reasons. One, if it's proprietary, I can't legally redistribute it. And two, I'm rather anti-proprietary. So I, I like the free software and the open source mindset. So how would one get started if one wanted to do this? Well, I, many people start with uh, maybe a five or six or seven year old laptop that isn't doing anything else. Uh, that's one way to go about it. Or if you have an older computer of some sort, uh, you could try it there. Uh, it is possible to install this side by side with Windows, but most people I know just dedicate the entire computer to Linux and go that way. So go to SourceForge, download the version 25 ISO file, and then if you want to, boot it in VirtualBox and try it and see if it's uh, to your liking. And if it is, then you could uh, install it on the computer of your choice. Uh, create a bootable USB thumb drive, uh, put it in, make sure your BIOS is pointing to it, and then go ahead and install it. Now, there's some detailed instructions in a document that I've created called Getting Started. And it's right there on the page where you can see um, other documents and the ISO file itself. Please be sure to download that version. Uh, if it's not dated um, July or August in the year 2022, then you've got an old version. Please get that document and please read it. 99% uh, of the problems that people report are because they didn't follow those instructions. So, so please be sure to follow those. There's not many, but they're important. So the target computer, as I uh, said a little bit before, any x86-64 computer, probably 10 years old or less will work. Uh, if you try to do it with older computers, you'll run into issues like, will it understand a four gigabyte or eight gigabyte thumb drive? Some of the really old computers didn't for a while. Uh, so you know, make sure that uh, you have a computer of reasonable vintage. Uh, I would say two to four gigabytes of memory is an absolute minimum. And these days, most computers have much more than that. Uh, the disk space after installation, it needs about 15 gigabytes of disk space, although users have reported to me that if they tried to install it on a disk smaller than 64 gigabytes, the installer complained. Uh, I'm not sure why, but uh, that was reported to me by one or two users. But these days, a 64 gigabyte hard drive is, is easy to accommodate. Um, the processor speed generally isn't an issue because most ham radio programs are not compute intensive. Uh, some SDR applications might be, especially if you're trying to decode uh, an FM broadcast uh, stereo station or something like that. But for the most part, it's, it, processor speed is not an issue. Uh, you do want to have a working network on the computer because sometimes during installation, it will try to download files that it needs. And uh, USB is required. And I said, or DVD. Uh, some of the really old computers have DVD. And you can indeed install it that way, although admittedly, I haven't done that for years. But it used to work just fine. 
So if you followed all those instructions and if you were successful in making the thumb drive and booting the thumb drive directly, you'll end up with a screen that looks like what you see on the slide. Now everything there is fully customizable once you learn how to do that. And, and just like when you looked at your very first HF radio, you saw all these buttons and knobs and displays and so forth. It was probably somewhat intimidating. But as you gradually went through it, you learned what those knobs and buttons were for, uh, when to use them and so forth. And people starting out with Linux, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, most of us have forgotten because we're used to Windows or Mac and we're past that learning curve. And some of us will, will have to go through that again if they try Linux. But uh, it's really uh, quite easy and, and mostly intuitive if you're used to those other operating systems. So if you wish to customize the background uh, or change the panel at the bottom with applications of interest, uh, all of those things are possible. And the menu is that little circle in the top left hand corner. If you click that, you'll get a menu. And not only can you access the ham radio programs and other programs that are on here, you can get at the, the menu that lets you shut down or suspend the computer or lock the screen and so forth. Uh, notice the third icon down on the left says install X Ubuntu Linux. Now it's X Ubuntu because it's using the XFCE uh, desktop environment. And that's a slight difference from other flavors of Ubuntu, which use different windowing environments. So when the time comes, double click that install icon and it will take you through the installation procedure. Uh, with some questions that are pretty obvious, like what is your time zone and what account do you want and, and so forth. Uh, when it talks to you about partitioning the disk, if you're on a machine that you want to dedicate to Linux, just pick the thing that says erase the whole disk and install Linux and let it do what it wants to do. Uh, but if you're familiar with Linux and want to do some custom partitioning, the installer supports that and, and you can do that at that time. So I don't know if I mentioned that, uh, please read the getting started document. Um, I, I wouldn't have taken the time to write it if I didn't think it was important. And you'll definitely save yourself some headaches uh, if you do that. So please take a look at that document. So the one work with the installation that I'm aware of is that the Ubuntu installer, for reasons unknown to me, fails to create the account that you asked it to create. Now for Ubuntu, it works fine. For me, it does not, and I don't know why. So I documented in the Getting Started Guide a procedure to make sure that your account is in there and associated with the correct groups to allow you to do everything you want to do. You just have to run a very short script in a terminal window and Getting Started uh, talks about how to do that. You do it once and then reboot after the installation and everything should be just fine after that if you follow the instructions. And you'll know you did it right because the login box will appear and whatever account name you created, your name will be there where my name is, is listed as Andy. Uh, if your name is listed there, you've done it correctly and you're probably okay. So use your password and log in. Now here's an expanded view of the menu. So I, I clicked that round circle in the top left corner and you can see there's you know, accessories and development and so on and so forth on the right hand side. And I've highlighted a menu that I added called Andy's Ham Radio Linux. And I organized things by my notion of organized. So for example, if you were to click the Ham Radio menu, uh, you'd see a whole bunch of programs, but they're all listed in one menu. Uh, some ham radio programs are listed in the internet menu or even the multimedia menu. And that didn't make sense to me. So I said, well, I'll leave that alone and I'll create the Andy's ham radio Linux menu and organize things my way. And you can see uh, where there's uh, a menu for antenna related software, Morse code, digital modes, et cetera. Uh, and if you don't like that organization, you can go in and customize this to your heart's content and uh, make it the way you would like it to be. So for the background screen, if you right click on the background, you'll get a menu that lets you bring up this uh, desktop customization uh, window. And I've put a whole bunch of uh, menu or, uh, uh, backgrounds in there for you that were covered under free or Creative Commons licenses. So it is legal to redistribute these as far as I know. And there are nine choices you can see there. And if you scroll down further, there are many others. So if you don't like the, menu, the uh, background that's there, you can pick another one or download your favorite background and, and use it as well. 
So some of the programs are command line based, but most of them are GUI based. That's graphical user interface. And some of them have a documentation that's available uh, via a terminal window via command line. And to make it easier for you to get at those, uh, you can see where the menu on the left says command line docs. And if you click those, you would get an appropriate window popping up showing you the documentation for those various tools. Uh, most of the documentation, however, is available uh, on the website of the people who wrote the application. And that's typically your, your standard you know, HTML kind of thing. Uh, and, and I would encourage you to go there because that will always be the latest and greatest documentation available. Uh, other pieces of documentation that I put on there, uh, if you see on the left, it says documentation and command line docs. And if you go down further, there's a gray nondescript box that says Andy's Ham Radio Linux, Dire Wolf docs, other Ham Radio docs, and W1HKJ docs, which is FL Digi and, and all of those. So uh, whatever documentation I could find, I put in there. But of course, I, I couldn't possibly put everything in there. Uh, but those are ones that I hope help get you started if you need it. So if you click on a couple of those, uh, Firefox will start up automatically and show you a, a list of possible files to view. And so you can see here where I got myself into the Andy Ham Radio Linux uh, documentation directory. And you can see where there's a listing of the sources, uh, the changes that were made uh, to the previous rev versus this one. The getting started guide is put there for your convenience. Uh, some how-to guides and so on and so forth. And so uh, those how-to guides I wrote based on my experience of how to get different things running. And I hope that they're helpful to you. So I put them in here. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through every item in every menu, but I, I've opened up the menu and taken screenshots for you. And I'm probably going to pick one or two items in each menu to talk about. Now, since I don't run uh, Windows or Mac, you know, if someone says to me, how does your program compare to N1MM? Well, honestly, I can't tell you because I've never run N1MM before. Uh, so I, I, I can't answer those sorts of questions. But what I can tell you is what's available in Linux and uh, something about when you might want to use these programs. So this is a program that I wrote, and 99.9% .9 of the software here was not written by me. Maybe four or five programs were. And this is a program called FL MoxGen. And for people who wish to build a Moxon rectangle antenna, you type in your frequency, the wire gauge, and hit calculate, and you will get uh, the dimensions computed for you. And you can go into the file menu and either print this page so you can bring it to your garage and build the antenna, or you can create a file that is used in just a moment for antenna modeling. And that way you don't have to write that file and, and the tool will create it for you. Uh, the look and feel of this looks exactly like the look and feel of a similar Windows program, but the source code is entirely different. I, I wrote it from scratch. So this is a couple of windows of an antenna modeling program called XNEC2C. And I fed to the program the uh, file that was created by FL Moxgen. And you can see in the three windows, uh, in the right-hand window on top is a picture of the Moxon rectangle antenna with a vertical orientation. Uh, you can see the picture on the left is a, a picture that shows the radiation pattern at whatever frequency the tool is looking at. And then down below, you can see where it does uh, front to back gain, SWR predictions, and so forth. And uh, this is the kind of information that this program will give you. Uh, you can model any kind of antenna that in there that you want, as long as you know how to describe it. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this talk, but uh, the software is there for you to do just this sort of thing. So for Morse code and for fox hunting, there's a couple of programs in there. Uh, for people who uh, haven't learned Morse code yet or wish to practice it, uh, there's a program that will give you uh, five letter groups. You'll hear it in your headphones, you'll write it on paper, and you'll compare it to what the program is telling you. And uh, you can set all manner of parameters uh, to get the CW sounding the way you'd like. 
Um, there's also a program in here called Microfox Config, and it's a program that I wrote for configuring the, uh, the Microfox uh, device that Bionic sells, and it's a 15 milliwatt transmitter on two meters, and if you plug it into USB and fire up this program, you can change the parameters for uh, what it transmits and how often it transmits it and so forth, so you can hide a fox and your friends will hopefully find it. Uh, this GUI also looks very similar to uh, a GUI for the Windows program, uh, but again, the source code is entirely uh, a clean room application. So next in the menu, we go down to digital modes, and you'll see there's an awful lot of programs that I put in the digital modes category. And, and again, I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, they might be familiar to you because some of these run on multiple operating systems, such as uh, FL Digi, for example, and what I rather affectionately call the FL family of programs that uh, Dave W1HKJ uh, has written. Uh, FL Arc, Digi, FL Message, FL Wrap, and so forth are all in here, as well as many others. Uh, for people who like to use uh, FT8, there's the WSJTX uh, program, which I know runs on multiple operating systems. Uh, there's programs in there for uh, Echolink, for uh, uh, SSTV, and uh, FreeDV, which is a free software uh, uh, voice uh, codec that I'll be talking about a little bit later. So this screen might look familiar to people who are familiar with uh, FT8. This is the WSJTX uh, software written by Joe Taylor and company. And uh, you'll recognize the waterfall and the decoding of messages and whatnot. I believe this looks the same across uh, the, the multiple operating systems. So if you've, if you've run it before, it's, it's no different on Linux. So Grid Tracker, I, I don't know how many people are familiar with this software. I think it's a most excellent piece of software, and uh, the folks who wrote it are to be applauded for their efforts. Uh, however, Grid Tracker is not installed by default on version 25. Uh, I created a how-to grid tracker document to guide you through its installation, but I will be including this software in the next release of Andy's Ham Radio Linux. Um, and so look forward to it when, when that comes out in who knows when I'll do that, anywhere from one to three months from now, uh, perhaps. And so I strongly encourage you to install it. It's got some really beautiful maps in there. If you wish to track what grids you've contacted, which grids have been QSL'd and so forth. And it doesn't have to just be for Fred Fish and Six Meters. You might track grids for any number of reasons. And you can do that uh, with the Grid Tracker software. And you can do a lot more with it as well. I'm just scratching the surface as to what's possible here. Um, but it does talk to WSJTX directly, so uh, your map will be uh, up to date, and it will show uh, dotted lines, if you wish it to, between stations that your radio can hear. So you'll get a feel of who's communicating with whom, and that will give you some ideas to where the band openings might be. And you can uh, configure Grid Tracker to uh, send your logs directly to Logbook of the World or several other uh, logging sites. And uh, that's all inside of the configuration of the program. So here's a map of my Grid Tracker setup. And you can see all of the red boxes are areas that I've contacted and QSL'd. You can see the day-night line. Uh, if you look carefully and squint a little, you can see the green line from USA to Europe, where a couple of stations are communicating. And then on the right, you can see an array of five by five boxes, uh, which are all, uh, you'll click them to get different functions of the software. Uh, the window on the bottom is a filtered view of all of the call signs that it can hear, and I chose to filter on uh, calls that are calling, you know, people that are calling CQ and whose grids I need, and those are highlighted in uh, that, that color there, the solid color. Uh, stations where I've gotten the grid but not QSL'd them, it's in a, the, the bottom one there, the third entry shows that where the grid is, is, is uh, highlighted a little bit in color and a little bit in black. So this software is, is highly configurable, it's great stuff, and it even will show you, uh, based on communicating with a PSK reporter, uh, which band has the most activity on, on FT8. So another part of this hobby that I wish more people participated in is things related to electronic design. Uh, I love doing hardware hacking and tinkering. I'm, I'm very adept with a soldering iron. I like to build the kits. Uh, I've not done schematic entry in probably 30 years, but there are tools to do that. 
Uh, I've done some Arduino programming. People who may not know, the Arduino is a, a small circuit board that you can program to do all manner of things beyond switches, blinky lights, and so forth. And uh, people who are familiar with the micro bit X radios from India, uh, those have an Arduino inside. And uh, I, I did some major league hacking on that software when I got my hands on one of those and had a great deal of fun. Uh, but there are other programs in there related to electronic design. Uh, the COIL64 program lets you compute a COIL size and number of windings to get X number of, of micro Henry's out of your COIL. Uh, there's uh, the, the, the GNU SPICE program is in there. SPICE modeling of analog circuits has been around for decades. Uh, KiCad for schematics. Uh, there's programs to aid you in identifying resistors, uh, Smith charts and whatnot. So here's the uh, Arduino GUI. Uh, and this is a program that I wrote for the very first uh, Dr. Duino board that came out. Uh, we had a kit build in my basement and six or seven of my uh, fr uh, ham friends were here. And some of them after building the kit uh, couldn't make it work. So I wrote a diagnostic that checked everything on the board and helped us isolate areas where there might have been uh, solder, solder uh, bridges and other such things. And so this is just a simple example of the kinds of things you can do uh, with Arduino. And, and this I'm pretty sure runs on multiple operating systems. So this is the COIL64 program that I recently discovered. Uh, feeded information about how you'd like to wind your COIL, uh, the desired inductance, the size of the COIL form, and so forth. And it'll give you an idea of how many turns of wire you need, uh, given the gauge of the wire, and so forth. And it comes out pretty close. I mean, anybody who's hand-wound inductors knows that uh, you're going to be off by a turn or two, uh, especially when you put it in the circuit. But uh, it gets you pretty close. And of course, KiCad for schematic entry. I'm not quite sure what this schematic is, but uh, there's a tool there to do it. And of course, many people are drawing schematics and creating kits and having boards fabricated and so forth. And all of this software uh, should be able to facilitate those activities. So the next menu has a bunch of selections related to uh, HF propagation. And of course, PSK Reporter is available. I, I guess uh, most people would know about that on the internet. Uh, you can get some solar data. Uh, there's a link to the VOA CAP program, which will predict uh, propagation paths and so forth. And uh, let me just go through a couple of those real quick. So the, the solar.gif file, you might recognize that. You've, you've probably seen it on many people's websites. And I have permission from the, the author to uh, make a link to it here so that you can see what propagation conditions look like. Uh, or if you want to find out the distance between two grids, there's a, a program here that will do that, uh, feed in the grids, and it'll tell you the distance and the azimuth and so forth. So you'll have some idea of uh, where to aim your antenna if you have uh, an antenna that can be aimed. Uh, the VOA CAP program, I rather like. It's a website. It's not a program running on Linux, but I, I put a link into it for your convenience. And if you pick two points on the map on the right uh, and tell it something about your mode and your power and your antennas, then on the left, it will show you a diagram that predicts uh, the time of day and the likelihood of making a contact at that on that particular uh, band. And of course, it is a prediction, so it isn't always precisely correct, but I, I found that it, it, it trends in the right direction. So this is a program that uh, I did not write originally, but I took it over from the original author and I maintain it now. It's a relatively simple logging program called Xlog. And as far as I know, it only runs on Linux. Uh, it's intended for more casual operators who you know, want to take their time and log the, the contacts and all that. Uh, yes, I have used it at field day. Yes, I have used it at 13 colonies uh, representing Massachusetts. But uh, unless you know the keyboard shortcuts and so forth, uh, it, it really wasn't intended for that purpose, but can be used for that. And as you can see, it's got your standard fields of, of the date and the UTC, the call sign band and so forth. Uh, it saves it in a flat text file. Uh, that's how it works, but you can export a diff and other things with it. And I do that and upload it to logbook of the world all the time without any problems at all. Uh, most of the effort that I've put into updating the software is to track changes in the a diff specification. So this is a logger that's there if you wish to use it. 
there's another more sophisticated logger in there called CQR log. And this one is intended for contesters who want more information. Uh, this will connect to various websites and download some of that information for you on the fly, uh, whereas Xlog won't. And so there's at least a couple of loggers in here that are designed to meet uh, different needs uh, for people using the radio. Uh, the next menu I put in is for uh, emergency management folks using uh, the NBeams software suite. And I don't think I have all of the pieces of NBeams in that menu, but I believe they are all installed. And so I, I did that for folks uh, to make it easier for them if they're involved in an emergency uh, communication situation. So FL Digi and FL Message we may have heard of. Uh, Silfeed is an email tool that integrates with all of those uh, and is useful in that situation. And there are other programs that are part of NBeams, uh, you'd probably have to go to the digital modes menu uh, to find them. Uh, in addition to that, there are some programs uh, for rig control. Uh, Chirp is a nice program for uh, programming your HT and your mobile rigs. Um, FL rig and G rig are, are rig control programs that you can use on your computer. And WF view is a relatively new one that I found that's very good at uh, talking to more recent models of ICOM rigs. And I thought I had a screenshot of that. Oh, I do. There we go. So here's a screenshot of WF view. You can see the controls at the bottom and the waterfall and so forth. Uh, this was talking to either my 7300 or my 7610. I don't remember what I was doing that day, but um, it's a very handy program for that. I don't know if it's if remote support is there or if it's planned. So that would be one thing to check because many people uh, are interested in doing that these days. But uh, it's a nice program. The gentleman has been working hard on it and uh, it's available on here for you to use. Uh, some folks are interested in playing with the satellites, and there are uh, some out there. Uh, I built myself a homemade azimuth elevation rotator with a Kent Britain cheap Yagi being moved around. And uh, my problem at home is I have too many trees with leaves and it blocks the signal. And in the winter, it's often quite chilly uh, to get out there, uh, even when the leaves are down. But uh, for the times I do get out there, this program comes in handy. Uh, you'll notice that uh, there are many satellites listed and they're in the, in the tabs of the, of the interface. And you can uh, get it to, you know, get uh, telemetry information from those satellites. I believe there's a way to send that information to AMSAT so that they know the health of the satellites and so forth. And, and this program's out there uh, in case you wish to use it. Uh, I happen to like this program. It's called GPredict, and you can uh, tell it your home location. And once you download uh, the updated information for where the satellites are, the TLE files, as they're called, uh, you can tell it which satellites to display on the map, and it will show you the footprint of that satellite. Uh, with other menu selections, it will show you the ground track of that satellite and give you a prediction of uh, when it will be overhead. And it, it's pretty darn close. Uh, within a few seconds. And that way uh, you'll know when the satellites are coming and you can decide uh, to be uh, available for that. It will tell you the maximum uh, elevation at your site. So if you have lots of trees, you might want to wait till the satellites, I don't know, 45 degrees up or higher uh, or directly overhead. If it's just 20 degrees above the horizon, you might not be able to get it at your location with, with trees and terrain and so forth. But all of that information is available in here. It also has ways to talk to uh, azimuth elevation rotators. Uh, and I got it to talk to my simple homebrew one. And it also has ways to talk to your rig to deal with frequency shifts related to Doppler and, and that sort of thing. Uh, nice piece of software. Now, here's a piece of software that's highly complex, and I hope I can do it justice uh, with my explanation. It's called GNU Radio Companion. And if you wish to describe a uh, digital signal processing algorithm, you can do so with this program. It doesn't have to be just software defined radio. It could be any digital signal processing algorithm. And you do it by drawing blocks in the graphical interface and connecting them with lines. And the blocks would be things like uh, a filter or uh, an audio output or a block representing some SDR device that's an input or any, any of you know, many, many other things could be used there. 
So you, you draw this high level block diagram of your signal processing application. And when you push the go button, GNU Radio Companion will write a whole bunch of Python code and then it will execute it for you. And uh, this program supports many SDR devices such as the very inexpensive uh, RTL SDR dongles. I think they're about 20 bucks or so. Uh, it supports HackRF and many other devices. Uh, there's lots of tutorials online for this. And if you're interested, I would encourage you to uh, try it out. And here's an example of what I did uh, based on a tutorial. So this may be an eye chart. You might want to download the PDF file of the slides to see it in more detail. But this is a block diagram of an FM radio receiver. It'll receive the FM broadcast band, and it will decode it and play it through your speakers. And you can see on the left, there's an RTL SDR block that represents that piece of hardware with a low pass filter, uh, a, the, the wideband FM uh, decoder, and, and some other things that do uh, some math on the volume and whatnot. And then the audio sync, which is your speaker. And each of those boxes, you can right click them and configure uh, the parameters associated with that box. And uh, when you push the, uh, the go button, which is the green triangle up top in the middle, if there are no syntactical errors, no drawing errors, it will run the code and you will see, in this case, a screen that looks like this. So uh, you can see where, uh, where it says station, the second one down, where I put three or four local radio stations in a drop down menu. And so this one is WCRB, which is 99.5 on the FM dial. And you can see in the middle, the yellow and red uh, squiggles on the waterfall. And you can also see the rectangular uh, digital sidebands that go with that station. Uh, and so you can, you can see that it's tuned in well. You can see that it's a pretty strong station from the bottom display. And uh, it comes through quite nicely with an appropriate antenna hooked up to the RTL SDR dongle. So another program related to SDRs is called GQRX. And I know that it works with the RTL SDR dongle and probably others. And you may recognize that frequency as the uh, NOAA weather radio. And again, hooked up to an appropriate antenna and tuned, you can pull that in. Uh, on the right, you tell it what mode of transmission you're trying to decode and some other parameters. And uh, it will just decode it uh, on the fly once you hit the, uh, there's a button up there that, that button just underneath file. Uh, click that and you're off and running. And again, you can see the waterfall of nearby stations and get a feel for which station is stronger because there are several of those NOAA weather stations. Uh, your local area, one might be stronger than this one, uh, but that's how you can see what's what. And here's a program that I just discovered. I've not actually had a chance to play with this program. It's called SDR Angel, and it looks to be highly configurable uh, with all sorts of different blocks that you can put on the screen to describe the signal processing and, and SDR uh, kind of thing that you wish to do. Uh, I'm afraid I can't say any more about it than that because I've not played with it, but uh, it does support the uh, M17 uh, uh, vocoder that is being developed. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So let, before I go into what's new and cool, let me take a breath for a second uh, in case you feel like you've been drinking from the fire hose. I'm wondering if anyone uh, has any questions for me before I move on. Okay, hearing none, perhaps we can take them after we, we shut off the recording. Um, so what do I think is new and cool in the Linux world of ham radio? Well, there's the free digital voice effort that isn't new, but is still ongoing. And this is work by David Rowe of Victor Kilo 5 Delta Golf Romeo down in Australia. Uh, and he calls it Codec 2. And it's a way of encoding and decoding a voice digitally. And it was designed to be used on HF and it was designed to understand uh, how HF propagates and so that when the, when the signal path degrades, uh, that the uh, algorithm for the voice would degrade a bit more gracefully as opposed to you know, when you tune your HD TV, you either get the station or you don't. It, it just falls off the edge. And if we're tuning an analog signal, we're used to, okay, we're gonna pick up a lot of static and the voice will be harder to hear, but there's still something there that we can potentially latch onto. And that was uh, what at least part of the effort was for Kodak 2 is to make it fail a little bit more gracefully. And also a lot of work was done 
to uh, make the bit rates uh, lower and still get something that was comprehensible. And so a lot of work has been done there. And the folks on the M17 project, which is a fairly uh, relatively new project, uh, they're writing low level protocols that employ uh, the code for Codec 2. And soon there will be applications that use those protocols to allow people to do uh, digital data and digital voice in a free software way, not a proprietary way. Uh, there is a particular model of HT, I believe it's the TYT380, uh, where there are instructions how to do a hardware hack on it and load a new firmware into it and make it into an HT that can transmit your voice using this M17 protocol. Um, M the SDR Angel program has a demodulator for M17. And so if uh, you have a friend that has such an HT, you could at least hear what they're doing and, and, and do some experimenting here. Uh, the M17 folks are big on experimenting, on openness, on tinkering. Uh, gee, don't all those sound like things that helped us get started in this hobby? Uh, I think they do. And so I would encourage you to go over to m17project.org and see what they're up to. And, and maybe some of these things will be of interest to you. You might want to download it and give it a try. So at a high level, I've been keeping track of the number of downloads of Andy's Ham Radio Linux over the years, uh, more for curiosity than anything. And you see it started in the very beginning. The numbers were quite low. Uh, not too many people knew about it. Uh, and as things matured and as the word got out there over many years, you'll see the number of downloads uh, got quite high. Uh, in fact, for one version, it was up over 14,000 downloads uh, with a few subversions of that included in that number. Uh, the far right column is version 25, which was released in June, and that slide is already out of date. We're up to about uh, 27 or almost 2,800 downloads uh, with that version and uh, going quite strongly. It's averaging about 120 or so downloads a week and uh, going very well from people all over the world who are interested in running uh, Linux and the ham radio applications that come with it. So I was very pleased and actually quite surprised when SourceForge sent me an email back in March of 2022 informing me that the Andy's Ham Radio Linux software collection had been downloaded 100,000 times. Uh, I had no clue. I really truly had no clue. I was really quite blown away by that. So I want to thank the five people who persisted in downloading it despite all those failures and uh, the other folks that succeeded. I'm, I'm happy that you did. And so thank you very much for all of the support uh, and the downloads and at least trying it. Uh, I hope most of you liked it, but I imagine some of you might not have and that's okay. I give you credit for at least downloading it and trying it out. Uh, and the local section here, the local ARRL section in Eastern Massachusetts wrote a brief article about that. And I've put the URL on this slide. So sourceforge.net is where this software is distributed. It's where the documentation lives. And there's also a little bit of a chat forum there where people can ask uh, technical support questions and, and post problems. And I'm asking people to only post problems related to things like installing this or, or other things that I have control over. If you're running program XYZ and it doesn't work for you, uh, the better bet is to go to Program XYZ's website and look there for documentation and the folks who are more expert at that program. I might be able to help you, and if I can, I will, but I don't know every program in intimate detail. So I would say go to the website of the, of the authors and those who support the program. I think you'll have a better chance of getting uh, help there. Uh, on sourceforce.net, if you search for my call sign, uh, not only will you find uh, Andy's Ham Radio Linux, but you'll find some other pieces of software that I chose to share with the community, all under the GNU General Public License. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, when I was playing with MicroBitX, I had, I believe it was a version three board. They're up to version six as of now. Uh, and I modified it for use by blind amateur radio operators. I put a voice chip in it. I made it such that you didn't need to be able to see the, the two line LCD display. Uh, I had a local uh, blind ham kickstart, or, or not kickstart it, but he, he kicked a, a, a local, I'm sorry, I'm not saying it right. I built a prototype of it and I brought it to his house and he tried it out. And so he was very happy with what he saw and gave me some pointers as to how to make it more accessible to blind hams. 
I built two of them. One of them works perfectly. One's a little flaky for some reason. And it didn't go any further than that once I posted the code. But I had a heck of a good time going through the effort. I learned a lot about what does it really mean to have multiple VFOs and things of that nature. It's just a software thing. Um, and so I learned a lot about that. And, um, and so that was a very uh, productive project for me. And uh, maybe one of these days, I'll, I'll take one of the units that I built that works and, and give it to a blind ham and see what they think of it. Uh, there's a couple of configuration programs for devices sold by Bionics, uh, namely the MicroFox and the TinyTrack. And I want to thank those folks for uh, giving me the information of what bytes to send into the device and what bytes can I expect coming out. Uh, most vendors won't do that, so I'm thankful to Bionics for doing that. Another vendor that was very helpful that way was Rig Expert. Uh, I asked them the same question years ago when I had their AA, I believe it was the 520 device. I said, can you please tell me how I can get the information out of it? And not only did they tell me, they posted it on their website for everyone to, sh to have. And I don't know the details of their internal firmware, but I do know the external interface. And I wrote a program in Linux for people to, to get that data. And then Dave, W1HKJ, took that and wrapped a GUI around, of it, around it. And he calls it FLAA for AA Analyzer. And so that's out there. And uh, one last program that I want to mention is called Wordsworth. And uh, my club president, George, Kilo in India Golf, I'm not sure. I think he won a cover plaque award for this with QST, but I'm, I'm not sure. But he describes a way to uh, learn Morse code a word at a time. And I collaborated with him and wrote a couple of programs to give people some text uh, that would get converted into Morse code that they could listen to to facilitate their learning with this method. Uh, it's very different from the hear a letter, type a letter, uh, way that many people were taught Morse code. And when Morse code was sent that way uh, during the war and it was uh, encoded, you had to do it that way. But if we're sending uh, English language words, uh, if we can teach ourselves to hear the words one at a time, we can probably uh, you know, understand the conversation without writing it down and perhaps be able to uh, go at a faster speed. Uh, so there's some, some documentation and some programming around Wordsworth. So this is the last slide of the evening. Uh, if people have questions, I would be happy to take them. Uh, I have sent the PDF copies of the slides to you folks for posting on an appropriate website. Uh, if folks have questions after this, please contact me. Uh, my email is Kilo Bravo one Oscar India Quebec at ARRL.net. And I'm also good on QRZ in case that email ever changes. So please don't hesitate to contact me. And uh, I want to thank you for uh, listening to this presentation. And whatever you do in the hobby, I hope you have a lot of fun doing it. So thank you very much. And 7-3. Well, thank you, Andy. Great presentation. Are there any questions out there? Yeah, I, I missed the beginning, but um, just looking at it. So this is, uh, you've, you've pre-installed the stuff in uh, um, whatever, X Ubuntu. Uh, but it's all available, like, you know, I, I could use that, but I'm, I'm not going to switch from Linux Mint, so, you know. Well, I understand the sentiment of not wanting to switch from whatever you're running that works for you into something that is an unknown to you. Uh, I, I fully support the idea that if what you have is working and you're pleased with it, leave it alone. I, I wouldn't mess with it. But someday, you know, that computer might get old and the software might get too slow or you know, well, maybe not a hard drive crash, but if something were to happen, uh, I hope that you would consider uh, this version. Uh, and sometimes people have multiple laptops. They have Windows and their favorite things there. And, and, and I have a dedicated ham radio laptop for Linux. Uh, but if, if nothing else, uh, please tell your friends who might be interested and let's spread the word that this is available uh, for folks who would like to give it a try. Yeah, it can always just, you know, multiple boot and try it or, I don't, there's not that much difference. I mean, Mint and, and Ubuntu, XFCE is, you know, you can get either way. All right, well, so if, if I want to reproduce this, I can find all this stuff somewhere, right, and install it. Yes, if you go to sourceforge.net and search for my call sign, you'll get a short list of programs that I've put out there. And one of them is Andy's Ham Radio Linux and go to the files 
and version 25, and you'll see the ISO file, which is all the software, and the getting started guide, and, and any other documents that I put there that I hoped would be of interest. Right, but that, that's, that's basically the ISO of, of your customized uh, Exabunt. Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. All right, uh, Barry, I see there's your stuff in chat. You want to catch those? It's just compliments about their downloading the distro now when they're going to be installing it. <clears throat> Excuse me, folks. I think he answered the question about let's see, the very first one. Is there a version for Raspberry Pi? So I believe I heard the question is, is there a version for Raspberry Pi? And I've been asked that before, and I have not, I'll say not yet, uh, created a version for Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's distinctly different in that the Raspberry Pi processor is an ARM processor, not an x86-64 processor. Uh, and honestly, uh, I just have not had time to attempt that as of yet. And for that matter, I'm not aware of anyone who has. Another one, uh, David wanted to know if you could briefly explain what a Linux system is for those of us who run exclusively Microsoft. Okay, um, Linux has been around since uh, the late 1990s. It is uh, based on the older Unix operating systems of which there were many flavors. And it's a, a clean room re-implementation of those Unix systems. Uh, started by uh, a college age student at the time named Linus Torvalds, uh, who continues to be active with the effort. So how is it different? Well, the, the paradigm of the operating system is entirely different. It was designed uh, to stay up and running no matter what, because in those days, uh, people made money selling computer time uh, via you know, dial-up. And if the computer crashed, they couldn't make any money. Whereas the Microsoft operating system was designed for a single user sitting in front of a computer to do uh, you know, basic things like sending email and, and, and listening to music and so on and so forth. Uh, Linux can do all of those things, but if you had 100 people logged into a computer, uh, it wouldn't even hiccup. Uh, we do that at work with our servers all the time. And so uh, it's, it's not owned by any one company. Uh, Linux is developed by a worldwide community of people who contribute uh, software of all types uh, to the Linux, I guess I'll call it an ecosystem. And uh, you know, people uh, look to, to put high quality code in there. Uh, the code is often peer reviewed. Uh, if there are bugs and things, they get fixed very quickly. Uh, I've had occasion to contact several authors of programs. And when I gave them a good bug report and, and gave them a way to reproduce the problem, in most cases, they fixed it very quickly and were thankful for the effort. Um, it's a very rock solid operating system. I have never had a virus on it. Uh, it rarely crashes. Now, a program from time to time might crash, but the operating system stays up. And that was it was designed to do that. And so those are some of the differences, I think, between Linux and, and Microsoft. And honestly, I haven't run a Microsoft operating system for over 10 years, and I, I don't have any of those at home right now. OK, uh, I see Dan's got his hand up. You want to take the floor there, Dan? Yeah, uh, so th thanks for sharing your work with us. Uh, it's very impressive. And I just want to confirm that um, it's um, x86 only. And is VirtualBox essential or will any VM that will load x86 um, virtual machines work with what you have in SourceForge? Well, I want to be specific and say that it's x86 64 bit no. because there's also x86 32 bit, but most of those computers are well over 10 years old, if I'm not mistaken. And I no longer support that. Although, yes, Linux will run on those, but I, I don't support that with this software collection. So I suggested VirtualBox because uh, it is open source, it runs on multiple operating systems, and people can do wow. it. If you wish to run it in QEMU or something like that, I don't see why it wouldn't work, but that's that's not how I debug it. I use VirtualBox, and for me, it works very well. Okay, thanks. It's, it's interesting, and there's a lot of things out there that are interesting, but you've put together a whole ecosystem, so 
<laughs> Who knows? Okay, Victor, you got your hand up. You want to take the floor for a moment? Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening. You, you just mentioned up and running, which is a very critical expression, a very critical term when we start talking about emergency management. Is there a greater expectation that Lennox will stay up and running in a catastrophe, or is it on par with any of the other operating systems or nets, however you want to look at it? that it just depends on whether or not power is available. Well, let me take a stab at that. So as long as your computer has power, I mean, of course, it'll be running. Uh, I run my laptop in the shack off of a 100 amp hour battery with a DC to DC converter. And uh, that that works for me, however long the battery lasts. Uh, as long as your computer has power, the operating system will run. and and I, that's true of any operating system. So maybe I'm, I'm missing the point of your question. I, I suppose I'm looking more at the greater, at the global network, as whether if a Microsoft or, um, you know, I can't even tell you who the carrier, let's say Frontier, the Frontier network is down or the, some, Yeah, so if, if, if your network is down, work, and Linux will, or if they're all on par. Well, if your network is down, you're, you're kind of hosed no matter what computer you have, unless you have a substitute. And there are mesh network and other sorts of programs that are out there that might help you communicate with other hams that are similarly equipped. Um, you know, you might have your friend next door might have a Wi-Fi hotspot and maybe you've got some sort of connection that way. Uh, but if if things hit the fan and you're, you're kind of on your own, uh, I, I hope that you've got all the software loaded that you would need to get through that incident, uh, you know, even without a network until until those services are restored. Oh, thank you. All right. Uh... Got no more hands up. Uh, Barry, how are we doing in the text area? We're doing good. There was someone that made a comment about Linux systems running for several years with no downtime or with no rebooting. I've heard of that too. All right. So I have a laptop in the house right now that I've updated all the software on it except the kernel because that does require a reboot to use that software. And it has been up for 565 straight days. That is a personal record for me. Um, and there's no UPS on it. It's, it's, it. it rides through on the power of the laptop battery for longer power failures. Uh, my previous experience, I had two other computers that stayed up for just over a year, uh, but they were on a, a UPS battery. And ultimately, I had a power failure longer than the, the capacity of that battery. So those machines went down. But that, uh, that to me, uh, is pretty robust. Now, again, uh, any, any computer might have a program that crashes, but the OS stayed up. And it was quite rock solid. Well, that is impressive, very much so. Uh, Barry, got anything else out there? That's all in the chat. Anybody else got their hands up? No. Anybody got any comments? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add something based on a comment that I saw in the chat. So um, many times to get the latest and greatest program, you might have to compile it from source code. And sometimes that's easy and sometimes it's not. But like anything, it's only easy if you know how. And not everyone knows how. I mean, there was a first time for, for doing that for those of us who know how. So. There are many programs, I don't know, 20 or so, I forget exactly, but there are many programs that I did compile from source and put in as this as part of this software collection. And I did that for you so that you could avoid that potential headache. Uh, some programs are easy to install and others require six other programs at very specific versions. And it's very fussy if you don't do all of that. And I didn't want any of you pulling out the rest of your hair uh, fussing with such problems. So I did those for you. And, and that's why. Now, sure, it makes it trickier to upgrade them when the day may come to do that, whereas things in the Ubuntu repository, you can just type uh, apt update and apt upgrade and, and you'll get it. So it's not a panacea, but 
I wanted to get the programs in your hands so that you can use them. So I think it's a fair trade off. All right. I see there's a question in chat there, Barry. Okay, yeah, that's about Winlink Vera working with no electricity. And it can work on emergency power. Yes, it can. And there are some groups that are testing that. Yes, it can. Okay. Well, I more may ask any comments out there. I think Jim has his hand up. I didn't see that. <laughs> he has his hand hand, not a hand hand. Oh, well, he's cheating. Yeah, right. Yes. Sorry about that. I just wanted to, a, a simple question. I know there was some talk about the PDF of your of all your slides, and, and I wondered, how do I get those? I'll be uh, sending it out uh, by myself. Somebody else will be sending it out after the presentation here. So you have, okay. you'll have a link. Okay, very good. I have a question. How are the uh, updates handled, both to the operating system and all the applications? So the updates are handled in the standard way for Ubuntu for most of the software, because most of the software is in an Ubuntu repository. Uh, for the things that I have brought in via source code, uh, one would have to bring the source code in and compile it. Now, it should be easier the second time around if you know how to do that because I left all the libraries in place. Now it's possible that it needs an updated library or something like that. So it might be a little bit more challenging to do if that's not a skill that, that you have. But what I try to do is every, I don't know, three to six months, whenever the mood suits me, uh, I come out with a new version that has all of that done for you. Everything that I know of has been updated. And if you choose to partition your drive as all the system files on the root partition and the slash home is another partition, you can tell the installer, leave slash home alone, delete and reinstall all the other stuff, and then you're good to go and you haven't lost any of your files or any of your configuration. Uh, that's what I recommend, but people do other things that work equally well. If I unmuted myself before I started the talk, hopefully that I help some people out there. Is there anything else? I just want to say thank you, Andy. I'm glad we were able to work this out. Thank you for working through the technical problems we had and then and the rehearsals. <laughs> and uh, we don't need to go into that. Well, for the thank rest you of the very people, much but, for, uh, for all you. of your patience with me as we worked through that. Uh, I really wanted to do this presentation and get the word out to people of what's available. I know it'll be good for some people and other folks may or may not be interested, but at least you've heard about it. I hope you'll tell your friends and I hope you'll have fun with the hobby. And uh, thank you once again for all of your kind words and comments. I see some claps and some thumbs up on the videos. So thank you very, very much uh, for that and for the opportunity to, uh, to chat with you today. All right. And, and it works very well in a virtual machine. Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I want to thank Lam. He's the one that uh, uh, suggested we have you come on. Very good suggestion. And it's a, a very good presentation. Okay, uh, is there anything else before I share it down for tonight? Don't forget we have a presentation tomorrow night on the Great California Shakeout. Yes, and that should be a good presentation, folks. I recommend you uh, join us tomorrow. Um, the person who's putting that on is a very experienced person, does a very good job. I think you'll enjoy it. So tomorrow night, same time, same place. Uh, hope to see you there. Anybody else? Good night, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Yes, good night. Uh, good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Andy, and thanks, Lem. <laughs> yes. See you all tomorrow. <laughs> yes.